So this is David again, and again, I'm in a favored position of being able to introduce our speaker, Andy Lasis. Uh, the title of his talk is Explaining Climate. Andy's a senior research scientist, again, at the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies in New York. He's been a member of the GIS Climate Modeling Group since the mid-1970s. His area of expertise is development of fast and accurate radiative transfer techniques to model the solar and thermal radiation that Tony spoke about with applications to the study of global climate change and the remote sensing of planetary atmospheres. He's the principal architect of the radiation modeling methodology that's used in the GIST Climate GCM. And whenever we have any questions about anything having to do with atmospheric radiation, we go straight to Andy's office. Andy, thank you for, this, for your presentation. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, how do we explain climate? Uh, that's uh, kind of a tall order, given the complexity of the uh, climate system. So uh, let's just consider this one explanation rather than the explanation. Uh, to help understand how the climate system works, there are actually uh, three basic principles that uh, help us to see how, how what's, what's important. Uh, the most fundamental of these is um, conservation of energy. Uh, this is a concept that I think we're, most everybody's fairly uh, familiar with. It sort of works like your uh, checking account or your financial account, uh, money coming in, whatever's in the balance and money going out. Uh, money uh, does not disappear on its own and nor does it, materialize that way. So we have to keep uh, track of energy in the climate system. How the nature does that, I have no idea, but uh, it's a well-established uh, principle. And uh, that has a, does a, have a direct connection to the climate. Uh, uh, early in the uh, 1800s, uh, when they were first developing the concept of uh, uh, conservation of energy, uh, Joseph Fourier, the uh, French mathematician, uh, noticed that the uh, uh, solar heating was not sufficient to account for the temperature, uh, the current temperature in there. So it uh, sort of uh, surmised that there must be some, uh, uh, the heat energy being radiated back out to the atmosphere and then uh, having to be radiated back to the ground to uh, increase the warming. So that's the earliest connection to the climate. Uh, the uh, second uh, important principle is uh, atmospheric radiation uh, or the Planck uh, uh, radiation uh, law in there. This is essentially anything that has a temperature radiates energy. And uh, uh, this goes back to the physics where moving charges uh, always radiate energy in there. So there's a balance between the radiation and the uh, uh, and then mo uh, the energy of the, uh, the kinetic energy of the system in there. So you may uh, perhaps uh, are more familiar with the uh, uh, Stefan Boltzmann law, which basically says that the uh, uh, energy is radiated like temperature to the fourth power. Uh, the Planck radiation law actually has a spectral distribution of that. So the uh, uh, key um, Compound, which you'll see in the next slide, we'll, we'll uh, get that explanation. Uh, let me also mention briefly the uh, third thing that we uh, want to keep track of. Uh, this is a more obscure principle. This is a, uh, goes in the name of Clausius-Clapeyron relation. Uh, it is basically uh, the, uh, related to how much water vapor the atmosphere can hold as a function of temperature. Uh, this also was uh, studied in the mid-1800s by uh, a scientist, uh, Clausius and Clapeyron in there who uh, were basically looking at how much water vapor in a, you know, uh, in a bell jar, you have water and air, and you change the temperature and how much water vapor that can hold. So this is a more empirical relation uh, in there. It's, uh, that's uh, developed, but uh, it's a little more slower moving than the, than the radiation, which, because um, uh, you have to evaporate and that takes you know, time uh, in, in there. So you're talking about maybe hours or days or you're not weeks. 
So let's uh, start with the uh, atmospheric radiation. I guess we have our slides uh, rotated uh, a little bit uh, in here. Uh, the Let's go ahead and rotate these. Okay, get them back. <laughs> So we can sit sit back set up back straight. Uh, uh, <laughs> nobody has to ah nobody has to hurt their head too much. Just okay. a little bit. <laughs> okay. Uh, so here uh, we have uh, solar radiation energy on the left uh, uh, coming in uh, in here, and uh, yeah, I touched the wrong one. And the uh, thermal radiation on the on the on the right hand, uh, where you see. Oh, okay. This will, uh, the uh, red line here. This is what the Planck radiation uh, spectrum looks like in here for temperature, surface temperature like 280 Kelvin, or it's about 15 degrees Celsius. In here, the scale here is uh, wave numbers, meaning how many waves of uh, you have in one centimeter length in here. And uh, uh, so the uh, red curve is what is emitted from by the ground surface uh, in there. This is, covers a whole, whole spectrum. And the uh, blue is what actually makes it out the top of the atmosphere. And uh, that includes uh, absorption by uh, molecules in the air uh, and uh, re-emission in there. And the green part then, the difference, is what we call the actually the greenhouse effect. That's the difference between the uh, what the radiation that's emitted from by the ground and what makes it out to the top of the atmosphere. On the left, this is again a Planck curve here, but this is for the sun, uh, about 5,700 degrees in here. And uh, there again, uh, incident on the earth. I mean, we have uh, part of it gets reflected. That's in the blue here, about 30% of the radiation uh, gets reflected. And uh, then there's about 20% of that that also gets absorbed in the atmosphere by water vapor and carbon dioxide, oxygen, and the rest of it gets absorbed at the ground. Uh, so that presents the incoming and outgoing energy balance of the, uh, of the earth. Uh, uh, so this next figure is kind of an il illustration of the uh, way radiator transfer works. Uh, this is actually maybe a exercise for students in there, what you need is a uh, hand calculator that has an exponential uh, uh, function on it in here. We have uh, 340 watts of solar radiation coming incident on the Earth. 100 of it watts gets reflected directly, and about 240 watts gets absorbed at the ground. And uh, if there's no atmosphere, then 240 watts will be emitted straight back out as thermal radiation. And this, uh, here we have, illustrating it with a uh, isolated single layer atmosphere uh, that's very tenuous, an optical depth of like 10 to the minus six, meaning it absorbs one part in a million of the radiation coming out of the ground. And so here again, we have conservation of energy being applied uh, that uh, uh, one part in a million that gets absorbed of the 240 watts uh, is about 10 to the minus four watts that must be then re-rated back upward and also downward from the atmosphere. Uh, here, it has little effect on the total, so the 240 watts that goes out here that's from the ground, uh, also includes 10 to the minus four watts that gets emitted from the atmosphere. And the emission from the ground is 240 watts, plus again, uh, 10 to the minus four watts that gets emitted along with it. Now, if we increase the optical depth to where it resembles the current atmosphere, uh, we need an optical depth of uh, 1.47. Uh, with that amount of absorption in the atmosphere, uh, we have, uh, uh, again, we add up all the pieces. Uh, it absor uh, so this is where we had to do some uh, iteration to get the numbers in here. We have a temperature at the Earth uh, the surface now 288 Kelvin, uh, radiating 390 watts, uh, it's absorbing 300 watts in the atmosphere. And uh, uh, so it's transmitting 90 watts. And then the atmosphere is emitting 150 watts in the upward direction and 150 watts back down. And so we, we add up all the pieces and everything is in equilibrium. And we have a temperature 
of the atmosphere at 242 Kelvin and temperature of the ground 288. Uh, this is uh, uh, kind of an example how the radiation works in here. It's a simplified version uh, that basically is using Beer's law absorption in here. And uh, if we increase the optical depth of the atmosphere to, in here, optical depth of 15, uh, that's getting pretty much close to saturation for the radiation. Uh, this then uh, has uh, 240 watts, uh, again, uh, solar radiation absorbed the ground, but the, uh, temp the ground has increased to 300, uh, 3 Kelvin, and it's uh, emitting 480 watts. Again, that's the sigma t to the fourth, uh, uh, Stefan Boltzmann law of radiation. Uh, and the all of that, and so it has to then to emit 240 watts up to space and 240 watts down. So that's where the 400, uh, 200, 480 watts of the ground comes from, is uh, the solar radiation, 240, and 240 watts from the atmosphere, and then uh, 240 watts going out to space from the uh, atmosphere to balance the uh, whole Earth. So that's a simple one layer model in here. The, the radiation is constrained within that layer. And there's no other kind of form of, uh, radio, uh, of energy transport. Uh, now, uh, here we get a complication. Now, if we have two such layers that are totally separated from each other, uh, but only interact radiatively, uh, this essentially doubles the, uh, uh, you know, it gives you an additional two hundred four. Uh, uh, 240 watts of energy, making like 720 watts uh, from the ground and still 240 watts from the top of the atmosphere. So this is, is just to illustrate that the uh, greenhouse effect does not saturate in there. The, the absorption within a layer may saturate, but the uh, net effect of the greenhouse effect does not saturate. So we keep adding more and more opacity into the atmosphere it uh, keeps on getting hotter and hotter at this surface for the same incoming solar radiation uh, in here. Now, the real atmosphere has, uh, does not have these artificial boundaries in the layers. The layers are uh, you know, contiguous, and there's also convective energy transport that uh, uh, eliminates these discontinuities uh, in here. Uh, so this is what the... Uh, uh, fluxes look like in, in a real atmosphere, the upward flux from the ground and, the, uh, and the, this curve and the downward flux coming in from the top of the atmosphere. So zero at the ground in here. And then this is what we do in radio transfer. We do these upward down flux calculations and differencing them gives you the, uh, what the cooling rate is within the atmosphere in here. So uh, we want to spend too much time on this. Let's look at this next slide. This is where it actually comes from. Uh, the uh, basic principle of the radio transfer is fairly straightforward, but we have to do a lot of a kind of accounting uh, because there are many wavelengths where the opacity is different at each wavelength, and we have to add all those up. Yeah, so this one is uh, uh, the upper left uh, is calculating the down flux from the top of the atmosphere going down to toward the surface. And uh, so we start at zero at the top of the atmosphere and uh, we get to the troposphere, it, it increases down to, this is where we get our 390 watts coming down, uh, or 300, it's more like 340 watts coming down from the atmosphere. And uh, on the upper right is the net flux. This is includes the, uh, upgoing flux minus the downward flux. And so this one, again, you see a spectral structure. Uh, the ozone band is, the uh, CO2 band is here. There's an ozone band in here. Uh, water vapor is uh, producing much of that structure in here. And uh, when we do a calculation where we uh, double the CO2, uh, then we see this change in the net flux. There's a decrease in the flux going out to the top of the atmosphere. And uh, this decrease is about uh, uh, minus uh, four to five watts at maximum near the tropopause, and then decreases in there. So this is basically what is the radiative forcing. We think of this as a positive radiative forcing, meaning it traps the uh, radiation in the atmosphere. And uh, it's about four watts for doubled CO2 in here. And then this same thing, uh, uh, is translated into a cooling rate, so the cooling happens more at the top of the atmosphere 
and the slight warming of the end at the surface. That's how the temperature changes. Uh, the third important thing that we were talking about was the, uh, the uh, uh, water vapor or the clausius clapeyron relation. Uh, here we did a uh, ex experiment where we uh, uh, instantaneously doubled the amount of atmosphere in the water vapor or, and uh, another experiment where we totally zeroed it out and then let the uh, uh, model run. This is a time uh, a function of a, a number of days. So what you see is that happening in the blue is kind of the control run. And uh, we're looking at the uh, ratio. Uh, when we double the water vapor, it quickly uh, rains out and comes back to where the normal is. And you zero out the water vapor. It uh, has to evaporate, gets transported around, and uh, it also comes back to the normal. So this takes about uh, well, 20 days here. It's back to pretty much to the normal. So this is what's considered a fast feedback process in the climate system, uh, meaning that the water vapor adjusts to the uh, prevailing temperature structure of the atmosphere. Uh, it's got uh, you know no choice. You, need, you over uh, moisten it or under moisten it, it comes back to the, temp uh, the temperature uh, profile. And uh, on the right hand are the corresponding uh, flux changes, radiant flux changes at the top of the atmosphere. You see when you zero out the water vapor, you immediately have uh, 50 watts more radiation going on, and then it comes back to the normal. And the uh, same thing with you double the, you, you decrease the outgoing flux, and it comes back to the normal. Uh, the bottom is the uh, uh, flux at the ground surface. Uh, these oscillations that you see here are, uh, this is a global average. So this is uh, the uh, uh, effect of the uh, sunlight on the uh, uh, surface. Uh, on the, when when you're, the sun is shining over the Pacific Ocean, there's very little surface temperature change in the globe. Uh, when the sun is over the uh, land areas, uh, there's a sharp increase in here. So this produces a diurnal uh, uh, change. And the difference between the uh, flux top of the atmosphere or the bottom of the atmosphere minus the top of the atmosphere is what the greenhouse effect is. And so you see the same thing reflected into the greenhouse effect. Now, if we make a look at this as a map, uh, this is what the greenhouse effect looks like for the uh, whole earth. Uh, on the left, we, uh, this is for the uh, pre-industrial climate, 1850. On the right hand is uh, uh, year 2000. Uh, the top of, are for winter time and the bottom are for the summertime. So you see a uh, little change in the structure uh, in there. Uh, most of the greenhouse is occurring in the effect is occurring in the tropical areas and much less in the polar areas because that's uh, you have the hardest surface temperatures and the coldest uh, cloud top temperatures going out to space in there. That makes a, a bigger greenhouse effect. Uh, what you, it's interesting is here is that the uh, seasonal change, a global value is like 150 watts for the greenhouse effect, goes to 162 in the summer uh, months. Uh, and the, going from uh, uh, 1850 to 2000, we only get uh, like a six watt increase. In the, the seasonal change didn't change, it's still like 12, 12 watts in here. So if we look at this uh, as a trend, uh, then you see that the greenhouse effect has been steadily increasing as the uh, uh, greenhouse gases have been increasing and as the surface temperature has been rising. Uh, the arrows that you see here are occurrences when you have volcanic eruptions. Uh, they temporarily decrease the temperature. And so you can see them show also decreasing the total greenhouse effect in here. So uh, this is uh, uh, what we see. And this is the, the uh, corresponding change in the uh, global surface temperature. Uh, here you see a lot of uh, variability on it, but the, an upper, upward trend that's basically similar to what was uh, what you saw with the greenhouse effect. Uh, the, there's a the natural variability that occurs is that the uh, uh, as a temperature, uh, I mean the conservation of energy is uh, is always it's it's wanting to uh, to uh, uh, force the system to its equilibrium point. Uh, but this is again, it's uh, the way the climate system works is sort of like your uh, uh, bank account. Uh, the incoming uh, funding and the outgoing funding occurs at the bigger rates than uh, than uh, your earning. I mean, your earning maybe our you know how many dollars per hour or, or whatever in there. That's a very steady rate. But the 
uh, expenditures and the income is, uh, occurs at bigger than the, the, the trend. So that's overshoots and then has to come back again. You know, so some of these natural fluctuations are things like El Nino's happening and La Nina effects in there that affect the temperature. But the overall trend is proportional to what the increase in the greenhouse effect has been. And uh, uh, this is, uh, the increase is due to the radiative forcings, that increase in the greenhouse gases here in the red curve. Uh, there are other things that affect it. There are the next thing that you see here, there's a negative effect due to increasing aerosols uh, in there that again are associated with anthropogenic uh, activities. Uh, the orange curve ripple here, you see a small one, that's due to uh, the sol solar 11-year uh, uh, sunspot cycle, uh, changes about a 0.1 watt uh, or 0.1% watt change in, uh, in the global forcing. And the uh, stratospheric or volcanic aerosols, you see some sporadic, uh, fairly large changes in the uh, negative type of forcing. Uh, all those are put into the climate model to produce the uh, change that you saw in the greenhouse effect. And uh, to break this down, CO2 is occurring uh, for more, uh, more than half of the radiative forcing. Uh, methane and N2O are uh, the other ones uh, in here. Uh, uh, CO2 is a more important one is it because it has a, a much longer lifetime than uh, the other ones. Methane eventually when it gets oxidized, it becomes CO2 in here. And the um, uh, others are more uh, variable, but still important. So all of these are considered. Now, uh, this is a trend that we have uh, observed uh, in the CO2, the so-called Keeling curve that has been steadily increasing. We're now above 400 parts per million. And uh, uh, also here is a measurement of the oxygen uh, in the atmosphere in there. So uh, one of some of the questions that pop up is, you know, how do we know that it's uh, a man-made CO2 that's causing the problem? Well, uh, uh, fairly easy. Uh, it's uh, uh, the uh, fossil fuel industries tell us that. Uh, the, uh, they dig out of the earth in terms of coal and oil about 10 uh, gigatons or 10 billion tons per year. Now, uh, a billion ton, a billion is a uh, thousand by a thousand. And uh, a water, a, a cubic meter of water is about a ton. So uh, one ton uh, and, and the density of coal is similar to that of water. Uh, so when we're talking about a, a billion tons, it's, uh, it's a thousand meters uh, in uh, cube in there. So we're talking about a cube of uh, carbon that is basically 10 football fields in one direction, 10 field booths in the other, and 10 football fields high, so the airplane altitude. And uh, so 10 uh, such cubic uh, kilometers are being dug out of the earth and they're burned every single year. And that produces uh, equivalent of five parts per million of uh, carbon dioxide. Now, the increase is about two and a half uh, parts per million uh, every year with an oscillation that's uh, due to the biosphere. So uh, the carbon that's put into the atmosphere is equal partition between the ocean and the, uh, and the earth. So there's equilibrium between the two. So if you put in uh, 10 ppm in the atmosphere, uh, five of them are gonna wind up in the ocean, five of them stay, uh, or, or five ppm, uh, Two and a half ppm go into the ocean, and uh, uh, two and a half ppm stay in the atmosphere. And then uh, to see that this was burned, uh, here is a measure of the oxygen. The oxygen has proportionally decreased by the amount uh, uh, that the carbon is burned. One carbon atom uh, picks up a molecule of oxygen to produce a carbon uh, uh, CO2 in the atmosphere. And uh, it's also important to see this in the uh, global context. Uh, uh, the geological context where you, uh, we have ice core data uh, that uh, uh, measure the change in, uh, in CO2, carbon dioxide, and methane, as well as the sea level uh, in there from the uh, oxygen isotope measurements. And from that, uh, we can in, uh, deduce how much of uh, ice cover change there would be and uh, assign a radiant forcing to the CO2 and methane. So this gives you the proportional radial forcing in there. And so when you compute the, uh, this with the temperature, so the, you get, you can reproduce the uh, 
the temperatures of the uh, uh, the ice age in there. So, so carbon dioxide really is a uh, control knob on the uh, climate system. Now, uh, we've been working on this for in this uh, book for about 40 years ago. This is where we started. So this is going back to 1984 to our primitive uh, guest climate model. And uh, so uh, this describes uh, some of the results and the, the early model in there. Uh, this is a coarse grid model, eight by 10 degrees, uh, roughly about 800 uh, pixels for the, covering the whole globe, uh, running the GCM that was as fast as it could do at, at that time in there. So this black uh, uh, curve on the left, this is a uh, we change the increase of solar radiation by uh, 2%, which produces a 4.8 watts of forcing. And the black curve is uh, what the uh, uh, climate model uh, temperature change. It was like uh, about three degrees in the pol uh, tropical regions and uh, about maybe six in the uh, four or six in the polar for a global average about four degrees. And on the right uh, and uh, uh, a curve, uh, this is for a double CO2 uh, in there. So uh, the red curve is the uh, forcing by CO2. You see that this is fairly uniform. Uh, with latitude, whereas the uh, solar is certainly more uh, concentrated in, in the, uh, in the uh, tropics. So the two forcings are pretty much equivalent response of uh, about roughly four degrees uh, global in increase in global temperature in there. Uh, that's because the uh, CO2 is a little bit more efficient than the solar forcing at the polar regions are more sensitive. And uh, the curves that you see superimposed in here. This is again a very, uh, uh, reproducing the uh, global temperature from the GCM with a more simpler uh, offline two-dimensional model which is using the changes in uh, water vapor, changes in cloud uh, that the model produced to calculate the, uh, the uh, corresponding temperatures. And this has also enabled us to uh, uh, separate out contributions from uh, water vapor. This is a blue curve the feedback effects, uh, clouds, this great change, uh, and uh, also kind of advective feedbacks in here. So, and uh, the, the also snow ice feedbacks here in the polar regions. And you see that there's some uh, uh, significant similarities between the CO2 and the solar forcing. So this is a, the type of experiment that we wanted to do is to com compare the, uh, the forcings and to see what kind of climate effect they would uh, have, independent of whether they're sources. And a little more detail here, this is a water vapor feedback. Uh, you can see that there are the solid, uh, heavy line, this is the, the net. Uh, what happens is that uh, uh, the water vapor increases about 33% across all latitudes. That's that gray curve. Uh, what happened is that uh, water vapor is also moved higher up into the atmosphere mostly in the tropical regions. So that produces more of a feedback effect. Uh, it amplifies the feedback at the water vapor. And there's also a negative uh, component of water vapor feedback because it changes the, uh, the lapse rate or the temperature gradient in the atmosphere. And that change in the, uh, in the atmosphere uh, produces kind of a negative change in there. And you see again, similar, uh, similarity between the uh, Water, the solar and the CO2 forcings. They both behave kind of similarly. Now, uh, here we, again, uh, this is a summarizing the total water vapor, uh, again, the blue and the CO2 and the, water, uh, and the CO2 and the red. And uh, uh, here we, on the right hand, we have the cloud feedback. Uh, there you see, uh, uh, I mean, Tony, uh, mentioned uh, many different types of cloud feedbacks. Cloud, low clouds behave differently than high clouds and so on. This is a combined effect because we didn't uh, have the diagnostic to separate out the individual clouds at that time. What you see here is a positive cloud effect in the kind of the uh, tropical mid, uh, mid latitude regions and a negative of a cloud feedback in the polar regions. Uh, the uh, Snow ice feedback, that's sort of as, it, as you would expect. It's, uh, it's mostly sea ice that's doing it. It uh, operates in the polar regions. Uh, 
And over the Antarctic, you see there's a uh, actual negative feedback. This is because the, when you double the CO2 the, the, uh, the, uh, CO and increase of warming, uh, that produced more snow and ice to fall on the, uh, or snow to fall on the Antarctic, and that produced a kind of a negative feedback there. And uh, then here's what we have, so-called advective feedback. This is uh, uh, energy that's being transported uh, by, uh, uh, by uh, the uh, atmosphere uh, uh, from equator polar horizontally, basically in there and converging in different places and diverging in others. Uh, so, uh, and this consists of uh, latent heat, sensible heat, and geopotential energy. Geopotential energy is basically moving air to a higher altitude that, you know, puts a, a potential energy there. Uh, and um, uh, so here, uh, it makes significant changes, uh, I mean, com it's comparable changes to the, uh, to the, uh, uh, water and uh, cloud feedbacks uh, latitudinally, but it averages out to uh, zero over the globe because uh, you're just transporting energy from one geographical area to another. And uh, the, uh, uh, the individual components of that are even larger, like they're an order of magnitude bigger than the radiant effects. Uh, here we see the geopotential energy uh, some actually some similarities and differences between the solar and the thermal because the forcing is being uh, being different uh, in here. And uh, so this is what we uh, had uh, available. Uh, it's more than thirty years ago. Uh, in here, the uh, it produced uh, pretty much the same kind of. Uh, uh, feedbacks that we uh, and sensitivity that right now the model was uh, four degrees for double CO2. Uh, currently, the number uh, is more closer to like three, and the main difference is in the cloud feedback because the cloud feedback in the early model was uh, more uh, simpler, more simplistic than it is is now. Now we're looking at more detail in the clouds in here. So that's uh, 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 what uh, it's interesting that we're seeing not much progress maybe in understanding it, or, or maybe we didn't realize that we understood it as well as we did back then. Uh, this next slide is, uh, again, a radiative type of effect. It's uh, how do we attribute the import, relative importance of different components. And uh, there's overlapping absorption in there, so we did this by the so-called single inclusion, where you just took, take one at a time and measure its radiative effect and, uh, and there, and subtract it out one at a time. This is sort of like if you had a basketball team with uh, you know five all stars and five uh, uh, substitutes in there. You want to uh, evaluate you know what is the who's the most important uh, player in, in there. So you could go by the, the you know their uh, scoring uh, averages and so on. But there's also things like rebounding and uh, uh, you know player uh, playmaking and so on in there. So uh, how would you evaluate the, uh, the basketball team? It's like you might try, uh, you know, just running the substitutes all at once, see what they can do. And then you put in one also player one at a time to see how much, you know, difference that makes. And then you can do the other experiment where you, you take one player of uh, the all-stars out, substitute a, a substitute in there and uh, make all the statistics in there. Then uh, this might give you a little bit different evaluation as to who is the most important player in terms of uh, how much they contribute to the game as a whole. So we did this for the, uh, uh, the atmospheric greenhouse effect in there. Uh, the total effect of the greenhouse is about, uh, this model is about 152 watts. Uh, we find that uh, water vapor accounted for about 49 or about 50% of the effect. Uh, clouds, about uh, 25%. And then the rest of it is what we call uh, the, the greenhouse gases. Most of it, 20% uh, for CO2 and about 5% for the other minor gases in there. So this is a, a case where uh, the radiative forcing All right, everyone, we had a technical difficulty there. Um, we're just going to keep okay. picking up where we left off.
All right, so we basically described this, uh, the, this distribution that uh, in here. So we see that uh, uh, when people say that water vapor is actually more important than CO2, uh, as far as the greenhouse effect goes, yes, indeed. Uh, water vapor and clouds, in effect, account for 75% of the greenhouse effect. Uh, but it is the, uh, it's the CO2 and the other trace gases that produce the radiative forcing. So, uh, uh, and if you increase the CO2, that produces a, then an in corresponding increase in or change in the water vapor and the clouds. And uh, so we can see in the next, uh, the last slide here, uh, is putting this in a much broader context of, uh, of carbon dioxide change, where uh, in the right-hand panel, uh, you see carbon dioxide changing from one eighth, where we have basically snowball earth conditions to uh, where we're really, uh, uh, you know, heating up the planet, uh, you know, 250 times the current amount. And uh, so what you see in, in here is that the, uh, uh, the habitable zone uh, is really very narrow uh, in terms of the surface temperature that you can see on the right-hand side, uh, which um, basically out outlines like uh, a range from half a CO2, uh, the current amount, which corresponds basically to the ice age climate and the, the double CO2, which go, is going uh, about, you know, four or five degrees in the opposite direction, the warming direction in here. So that's uh, sort of where we are in the middle. And uh, uh, the uh, uh, problem, if you keep increasing CO2 in the atmosphere, uh, it gets warmer and warmer and warmer, and pretty soon you're gonna have uh, temperatures that are untenable uh, for, uh, uh, for, for life on the, on, on the earth here. And uh, what you see there, that yellow part, uh, that is the uh, greenhouse effect due to water vapor and the clouds. So the radiative forcing by CO2 is just the, uh, that green part, which does not change all that much. So uh, that this, uh, results from this exponential uh, dependence of this Clausius-Clapeyron relation in there. So that's uh, uh, kind of the uh, essence of uh, where we're at in terms of uh, the relative perspective of uh, uh, explaining uh, the climate in terms of CO2 that's happening. Thank you for your lesson. Great. Thanks so much, Andy. Um, we are going to open it up for questions again. Um, mm -hmm. If Again, please use the, the chat function um, to ask any questions that you might have. Um, we're going to start it off again with David. Um, uh, to begin the questioning. Andy, again, thanks so much for that very comprehensive understanding and depiction of the various radiative forcings that are affecting our climate system. There are people who feel that given the uh, difficulty in removing carbon dioxide or limiting its growth, that maybe we must try some way to put negative forcing into the climate system to reduce the temperature, uh, so-called geothermal or uh, engineering. Uh, do you have any feelings about the validity of this approach? And if so, what could we possibly do to limit warming if carbon dioxide continues increasing? Well, <clears throat> I mean, a lot of the geoengineering uh, can provide some uh, possible potential solutions. But uh, I think this is a little bit like uh, uh, the medical practices in the dark ages, like uh, bloodletting and purging, where they might help in some cases, but you're never really sure what the uh, actual outcome might be because there are potential consequences in here that uh, uh, the one that's most often uh, talked about is putting uh, uh, reflecting aerosols in the stratosphere. Uh, typically, that thing involves uh, sulfur, uh, sulfates of some sort. And uh, uh, in the process of doing that, you're also building up uh, acidity in the ocean. So you, and, uh, in there, so you may have other uh, consequences to worry about in here. So geoengineering has some possibilities, but uh, I think the consequences have not really been uh, explored in there. So I think the uh, real solution is really to stop increasing the, uh, uh, or limit the increase of CO2 into the atmosphere. Removing it is a very difficult task. Remember, 
you know, for one ton of CO2 that you uh, burn, uh, you've got, uh, you know, like, I don't know what, three and a half tons of CO2 to, uh, for one ton, ton of carbon that you burn, you've got about three and a half tons of CO2 to get rid of. And so, uh, so it's not, uh, not a simple thing to, uh, uh, you need more than the 10, you know, cubic uh, kilometers of CO2 that you have to then remove from the atmosphere. And where are you going to put that? All right, we've got um, another question uh, from Carmen. How would you suggest that one best explain climate and climate change to young learners and the general public? Uh, well, I don't know what the, it, it depends maybe what the real, the question that they are in there because uh, it's such a broad topic in there, it has no simple, single explanation. Uh, there are many, uh, uh, many things to consider in here. It's, so one is like uh, uh, some of the potential consequences. I mean, we know for sure that the, you know, if the, cl uh, the climate warms, uh, the sea level is gonna rise. Uh, and uh, that spells uh, bad news to places like Miami, maybe even New York here, in here. Uh, other than that, there's also increase in storms that's associated with increasing uh, global uh, uh, warming. And uh, so there are a lot of potential things that, uh, that uh, can, uh, can uh, occur. So uh, uh, I think we just need to be inf informed on all aspects of it. We need more measurements as to how the climate system is uh, responding in there. So it's a uh, open-ended question that uh, uh, is gonna generate many more answers. And uh, Matt just shared a resource again in the chat um, for climatekids.nasa.gov and uh, climate.nasa.gov uh, for some resources uh, in terms of how you can uh, best explain. And Matt, I'll, I'll unmute you again in case there's anything else you wanna say about that. Yeah, those are uh, some great resources just for bringing kids into the ideas of what's causing climate change and gives a very general overview. Um, and there's also some great content on climate.nasa.gov that co covers the issue a little more comprehensively. Um, on the second site, it very often gives an update of current carbon dioxide, global temperature, Arctic ice minimums, ice sheet loss and sea level rise to up-to-date current values. And there's a lot of facts, articles, solutions, opportunities to explore and resources there to, to dig through. But it's uh, between the two of those, there's some good content um, and some great photos to use. Thanks. Great, thanks. Um, we have uh, a question from Deborah. Um, what new forms of carbon sequestration are being designed? Are you familiar with the LDEO senior research scientist, Martin Stute, and the studies of carbon sequestration in uh, basalt by liquefying CO2 and having it mineralized by the basalt? As I understand it, it can be sequestered by tons. Uh, well, yes, it can be done in there, but I think it still uh, becomes a question of magnitude in there because uh, uh, when you remove CO2 from the atmosphere, there's more CO2 that comes back up out of the ocean. So it's like we have to uh, basically uh, uh, re-sequester all this carbon that has been dug up, uh, uh, including also the oxygen that it has picked up in the, in the process. So uh, uh, while it can be done, it, uh, it seems to me, would be more expensive than maybe limiting uh, the growth of CO2 in the first place. All right. Um, well, I think um, that closes the um, session for today, um, unless we get any other questions in the meantime. Um, we wanna thank everybody and we wanna especially thank um, our presenters today, um, Andy Lasis and Tony Del Genio for their great presentations. Um, I'm gonna give it to David really quick in case he has any last words that he wants to share on this. Thank you. I, I hope the audience ap appreciates the complexity of the system and the way both of our speakers
have not tried to simplify the issue, but presented as clearly as possible all of the forcings and feedbacks that go into creating this system and also indicating how this system, how we are changing the system right now. Tune in in about three weeks or four weeks for the next three seminars in this webinars in this series. Thanks again very much for listening.